Welcome back to our lecture series, Linear Algebra Done Openly. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. This will be the first video for section 1.3 in the textbook entitled Vector Spaces. And just as a reminder, our goal in chapter one with regard to learning about linear algebra is really just to expose us to the primary ideas that linear algebra is all about. You can think of this as the who's who's of linear algebra. Or another way I like to think about it is like to understand, I'm trying to help us understand what does the word linear actually mean. Now, we've learned in previous sections of, of the book here about fields and linear equations. Uh, so we learned a lot about what a linear equation meant like, and previously we talked about systems of linear equations. The next important linear structure uh, that we're going to discuss is the idea of a linear combination. And this is a word that makes sense in the context of a vector space. Now, in order to define what a linear combination is, we need to first understand what a vector is. Uh, now, some of us might have some exposure to the idea of vectors in the past, uh, perhaps like in a physics or other science or engineering course. Uh, to a mathematician, these are uh, vectors, certainly, but a vector can be much more than that. Um, honestly, when it comes to vectors, I often think about uh, the villain from Despicable Me, right, who, who's also named Vector, right? He's committing crimes of both magnitude and direction. And again, that's often the physical interpretation of vectors. Uh, but it turns out that in a mathematical setting, a vector is going to be anything that we can add together or we, that we can scale. That is, we should be able to add together vectors and we should be able to scale a vector by a different type of number, which we call scalars. Scalars we talked about already in the context of a vector field. Vectors themselves are going to be different types of numbers, which again, borrowing the physics example, a vector is a, is a mathematical quantity with both direction and magnitude. So to formally define what a vector is, we're going to first define the notion of a vector space. A vector space, as the name suggests, is going to be a collection of vectors that satisfy certain conditions. A vector space over a field. Now, our primary goal will be to discuss vector spaces over the real field, the field of real numbers. But honestly speaking, the algebra we develop can be done over various different fields, such as the rational field, the complex field, uh, finite fields like ZP, uh, just as an example, right? There are many more fields than just these four, but these are the ones we're going to focus on in this class here. So a vector space over a field is a non-empty set of, which we'll typically call that V for vector space, and the elements of that vector space we call vectors. So if we were to stop right there, this gives us a definition of what a vector is. A vector is just an element of a vector space. Well, what's a vector space? The definition is going to feel very similar to a field, although the elements of a field, remember, we call them scalars. A vector space will have something which we call addition. Now, because the field itself has addition, sometimes we have to distinguish these two additions which are, comp which are playing together here. So for a vector space, this is sometimes called vector addition, and the addition we saw over the field we might call scalar addition, if we need to distinguish between the two. So one operation will be vector addition, and then the other operation will be scalar multiplication. Now, unlike the Op, the multiplication we define for a field. So over a field, multiplication was you take two scalars and you multiply them together and you get a scalar. In the context of a vector space, scalar multiplication here means that we're going to take a scalar, which comes from our field F, and we're going to combine it with a vector, which comes from the vector space, and this produces a new vector. All right? Now, a convention I should mention that that we use when we describe vectors here is that scalars will generally be written as lowercase alphabetic symbols like C and D or A and B, oftentimes at the beginning of the alphabet. We typically use letters at the end of the alphabet as for variables and um, letters at the beginning of the alphabet for constants or unspecified arbitrary numbers. Uh, and so that's how we'll typically denote a scalar. On the other hand, vectors, we're typically going to use a boldface font so that when vectors and scalars, scalars co-mingle with each other, the vectors will be bolded, the scalars will not have that boldface font, and so it becomes easy for the reader to distinguish between vectors 
and scalars. Uh, for, so for example, in this line right here, you can see that these, the U and V are bolded, thus they'll represent vector quantities, and then the scalar C is not bolded. Now, when one writes on hand, by hand, bold face font is very difficult. And so oftentimes you'll see that someone writes a vector like U and V, but then we'll draw some type of little arrow over it to indicate that this is a vector quantity. You'll see this notation commonly used throughout here. Just wanted to mention that notation before we go on. So a vector space is a set of objects, which are called vectors, which has a vector addition and a scalar multiplication. And just like a field, there are certain axioms required for these two operations in order to call it a vector space. Now the list for a vector space is not as long as it was for a field, although there are some things that are very similar. So with describing a vector addition, we require that vector addition be commutative. U plus V is the same thing as V plus U. We require that vector addition uh, be associative. That is, you could redo parentheses however you want. U plus V, then adding W to it, is the same thing as V plus W, then adding U to it. Um, you can either add the first two first or the last two first, and we'll make a difference. Um, we require there is some type of additive identity associated to vector addition. We get U plus what we call the zero vector, U plus U. Or, sorry, u plus 0 is the same thing as 0 plus u, which is just u itself. So an additive inverse. And we also we want additive identities. We also want additive inverses, which just like a field will refer to the inverse of a vector u as negative u. Um, and this will have the property that u plus its inverse will just equal the 0 vector. So when you look at the axioms of the addition over the scalars on the field versus this vector addition. These are the exact four same properties. We want commutivity, associativity, identities, and inverses for our vector addition. That part's the same. Um, what's going to be different are the axioms associated to scalar multiplication. We're going to have some distributive laws. Um, so this one right here says if you add together two vectors and then you scale it uh, by a scalar, you could actually distribute the scalar across the vector addition, and you could get the scale, the, the scalar product of C and U with C and V, and add that together. That would be the same thing. So we get we get a distrib distributed property across uh, the addition here. So scalar multiplication distributes over vector addition. On the other hand, the second, uh, so previously we might refer to this as the left distributive property. Um, axiom six right here looks like the right distributed property. We can distribute a vector over, this time this is scalar addition. This is what you have to be aware of. Here, if you add together two scalars and then multiply that by a vector, that's the same thing as scaling the vector and then adding them together. And so this is, this is what can get sometimes confusing when one thinks about these abstract algebra notions. We're using the symbol plus to mean two different things right here. On the left-hand side, that plus symbol means scalar addition. We're adding together two scalar numbers, and then we're multiplying that by a vector. In contrast, the plus sign on the right means vector addition. We're adding together two vectors, which is a different meaning of addition. And we can distinguish between scalar addition and vector addition by context. And this can be a little bit confusing at first, but we get used to it the more practice we get. Uh, axiom seven here, uh, this is sometimes called homogeneity, or to me, this kind of looks like an associative property when it comes to scalar multiplication. If you scale a vector by D and then you scale it by C, this is the same thing as just scaling the vector by CD, uh, which again, you can redo the parentheses with regard to scalar multiplication. And then lastly, we want that scalar multiplication has an identity. That is, if you multiply by the number one, which lives inside of our field F, then that's the same thing as just the vector itself. Scaling by one doesn't do anything. Now we have a shorter list of axioms when it comes to a vector space, and that's because the field of scalars already has a long list of axioms built into it. And so a lot of nice properties can be uh, guaranteed because the field of scalars itself has that list of 10 axioms. For example, we can take it for granted that our field has the number one in it because that's an axiom of the fields, of the field of scalars there. Now I want to present you an example of a vector space before we, before we end this video right here. Now the, the example that many of us are probably already familiar with is the one that comes from from physics, where in that context, vectors, 
a physical vector is just an arrow. And our vector villain from Despicable Me, this is the type of vector he was referencing when he gave his name there, right? A vector is a quantity with both magnitude and direction. Uh, so we often denote this as a picture of an arrow in the plane or in three space, in which case there's some type of direction associated to it, right? If we take the positive x-axis, we could measure the angle our vector forms with the positive x-axis. That gives us a direction of some kind. We can also measure the length of the vector. So it has its length. How long is it? And that's what we often refer to as this magnitude. The longer the vector, the more uh, magnanimous it would be. Is that the word I should use here? The more powerful the vector is. Like a longer force vector means it's a stronger force. Uh, and so this is this is going to be like a numerical quantity because the magnitude itself will be a scalar quantity but and then the direction itself is also a scalar quantity but then the vector the arrow puts together two scalar quantities and force and creates this new object which we call a vector um, in which case a two-dimensional vector will just be a magnitude with a single direction in three dimensions or higher we need multiple directions not just one to describe where it's pointing in space here now, if these are vectors, we have to be able to add them together and we have to be able to scale them. So what does it mean to, first of all, add vectors together? Well, adding arrows, well, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, like, what is, what is Volkswagen plus Pikachu that equals happy day? You know, what does it mean to add things which are not real numbers anymore, right? We have, we have to, in some regard, define what addition means in this context. So when you have two arrows... So take these two right here, for example. There's the arrow U and there's the arrow V. Now, one thing you should be aware of when it comes to these physical vectors, like if you take force vectors, for example, the location of the arrow in space doesn't matter, right? It's only the direction and the magnitude that matters. So if you draw the same arrow pointing the same direction, the same length, all three of these vectors should be considered the same quantity from a physics point of view. And as such, we can position our vectors so that they have a common point. Um, like each, each of these arrows here, it has the head, which is where the arrow is pointing, and then it has its tail. Um, if you're in archery, this would be where your, your feathers are, right? We could position the arrows so that they have a common origin, a common, uh, the tails touch each other. So position the tails and then form a parallelogram using those two vectors. What I mean is you're going to take the vector, uh, one of the vectors, U, and you're going to copy it and put that copy at the head of V, over here and then copy the vector v and put it at the t put its tail at the head of u and this will always form a parallelogram in the plane now even if you have three dimensional vectors or higher dimensional vectors um, if you take two vectors um, the, the their common tail plus their two different heads will give you three points potent most likely non uh, collinear points and these three points will always determine a unique plane in whatever dimension you're playing around in so th this this makes sense to focus just on two-dimensional pictures right here these two vectors together will always form a parallelogram and if you connect the dots from one corner of the parallelogram to the other corner of the parallelogram uh, that vector is will be defined to be u plus v that's the sum of the two vectors and because of this geometric principle adding together vectors, physical vectors, is often referred to as the parallelogram rule. We take the diagonal of the parallelogram associated to these two vectors. Or another way of thinking about it is that instead of putting the two vectors so they share a common tail, you could put that you have one vector, and then at the head of the, of the first vector, you add the second vector, like so. And then the sum would be the net vector that goes from the tail of the first one to the head of the second one. This approach can be very advantageous when you start adding together multiple vectors because you can have a vector going here and then a vector going here and then a vector going here and then a vector going here, in which case the sum of the vectors, the net vector, will just be the head, will go from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector. So this would be the sum of all of those vectors. It's a very nice geometric principle known as the parallelogram rule. That's how one can add together vectors. How do you want to scale vectors? Well, there's two things to consider. If you have a vector and you times it by negative one, you want to create the additive inverse. What you do is you just take the exact same, the same vector with the exact same length 
you're just gonna switch the direction, right? So you just put you just switch the the head with the tail. That's all you have to do to form the inverse vector. Um, and so now it'll be pointing in the opposite direction. The reason why we we want this to be our inverse vector is that if you put these things head to tail, right, by the parallelogram rule we learned a moment ago, if you go this way and then you go back this way, you're gonna end up with just a single point. The net effect is just you get a single point. And this is what we mean by the zero vector in this, in this context. The zero vector is the vector with no magnitude. It doesn't move whatsoever. And so the way to cancel out a vector will just be to take that same vector and point it in the other direction with the same magnitude. That's what it means to multiply a vector by negative one. What does it mean to multiply a vector by some positive real number? Well, if you have a vector v like you have right here, scaling it means to elongate the vector by that quantity. So you see illustrated here 3v. It'll be the same direction as the original vector, but now it's going to be three times longer. The magnitude got multiplied by uh, that amount, right? And so you could, so multiplying a vector by a positive number larger than one would make it get longer, by a small number like between zero and one would make it get shorter. And so we can physically dilate or contract vectors using scalar multiplication. And so this is how one defines for physical vectors uh, the ideas of vector addition and scalar multiplication. And one could check that these definitions of addition and scalar multiplication satisfy the eight axioms of the vector space. So these physical notions of vectors, these arrows, in fact form a vector space. And this is one of the most canonical examples of a vector space.